So what is Taylorism? In this video, we are going to discuss what is Taylorism, the core concepts of Taylorism, the benefits and the limitations, and can we learn anything from Frederick Taylor in 1910s today? Can we leverage that? Is there anything that we can learn from back then that will help us today? Hey, I'm Mike, the Agile Coach from Surge Management. Let's get into this. Frederick Taylor was a mechanical engineer who became one of the first management consultants. He got fed up with managers using inefficient processes that were unscientifically validated through word of mouth. He believed that you could take a process end to end, break it down into small chunks and make every little chunk efficient. He wrote the first book on management called Scientific Management, or Principles to Scientific Management. Frederick Taylor was one of the key people who helped Henry Ford perfect his systemized car delivery. So for context, this was a time when the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. We were mechanicalizing labor and factories were popping up all over Northern America and Europe. And Frederick Taylor wanted to make it scientific. He wanted to have hypothesis, he wanted to test that hypothesis, and he wanted to improve the process systematically. And then he wanted to scale it. So he'd have small experiments, and then he'd scale to the rest of the industry, not just organization, the industry. Fast forward 100 years, and scientific management has been nicknamed Taylorism. So Frederick Taylor invented scientific management, which was a scientific approach to managing employees and managing the process that was nicknamed Taylorism. Some of the key concepts of Taylorism that we hear about even 100 years later, the division of labor. In Taylorism, Frederick Taylor believed that he could take the end-to-end -end process and split it up into individual tasks. These individual tasks should be made efficient. The right person would do each task, who was suited for each task. Just like a mechanical cog is perfect for a position, Frederick Taylor believed that each person was designed for a single or two tasks. The efficiency gains were in that person becoming a master of that specific task. Treating people like robots was great for Frederick Taylor. It was scalable, it was efficient, it was fast, and you didn't actually need a high skill set. It kind of reminds me of the French versus the English in their war, the long bows versus the crossbows, crossbows being the French, long bows being the English. In the first part of the war, the English would slaughter the French. The skilled long bows would um, take out their French armies before they even came close. However, the long bows took a long time to master. These skilled people couldn't be scaled. So once they were killed, it took a long time to rebuild their armies. The French at the second part of the war had crossbows. Any man could string up a crossbow and fire. It may not go as far or as accurate, but they could shoot a lot more crossbows. This is what kind of reminds me of Frederick Taylor, is he was able to take the idea that if industrial revolution was to scale, we need more people on the ground. 
So having these specialists who understood the end to end, who could master the trade for customer value, they weren't required. What we needed was a whole bunch of mechanical cogs that could be scaled because anybody can move item A to place B. Taylor believed in authority with responsibility. He believed that a natural hierarchy was not only good for the managers and the company, but also the employees. However, it was a little bit different to normal management we have today. Frederick Taylor believed that the people in management should hold the responsibility to create the process. The managers were the thinkers and the workers were the doers. So as such, the managers were meant to look at all their employees, see who was performing the best, and then pay them the most. So each employee will get paid more based on the production that they did. So the harder you worked, literally the more money you would get. But the process was designed by the managers and the company owners would decide which processes we would be looking at first. So real top-down structure. Frederick Taylor wanted to find out the most efficient way to do each task. He created a methodology called the time and motion study. In this study, he would look at the overall time that it would take the average worker to complete a task. And then he would look at the frequency or the amount of times that that motion was created. What he was looking for was to complete the end task in the fastest time possible by looking at the amount of time it could take someone to do the task for the least frequency. A good example of this is the shovel experiment that he did where he took a shovel and he got a whole bunch of men to take sand from one area to the next. He measured the average time. The next day, he took a little bit of shovel off of each shovel and asked him to push it back. Now he kept doing this until he found the right size shovel for the best efficient use of shoveling sand. Now that may seem a little bit silly and I'm sure the employees were very happy about moving sand backs and forwards for days on end. But what he found was is a heavy shovel would mean that less frequent shovels could be done because it's so heavy, but the smaller the shovel, of course, the less sand it takes. So there'll be a midpoint in this chart, and that's what he was looking at, every single task. And of course, then those shovels could be scaled up. And even today, we have many types of shovels for different types of jobs based upon the learn and adapt thought process that Frederick Taylor actually invented. System thinking and being lean was almost part of Frederick Taylor's initial methodology. Without obviously being called that, he would look at the end to end, break every task down and have an efficient way of creating each task for the end goal. And he would remove waste from every single part to create a a higher efficiency rate for each employee and each process. As I mentioned, Frederick Taylor's work was vital in helping Henry Ford. Henry Ford reduced his time from using the scientific principles from Frederick Taylor from 12 hours to 93 minutes to produce a car end to end. I mean, that's staggering when you think about it. You're talking about 1910, 1916, and you're taking a car that took 12 hours on a conveyor belt down to 93 minutes. That is a competitive advantage based on operational excellence. And you can now see, just from that one bit, why Henry Ford was able to scale very quickly and sell more cars at an affordable price. So there are obviously some great positives to Frederick Taylor's scientific methodology. Efficiency went up by 400% or up to 400%. Less workers were required. Companies made more profit. They became operationally lean. 
there was less waste, there was no longer required for skilled labor, you could hire anyone, you could scale much faster. But what was the limitations? So one of the quotes from Henry Ford is, a customer can have any color they want as long as it's black. Taylorism assumed two variables that must be constant. The human capital must have the same motivation throughout the process, throughout the year. Rain or shine. And the customer demands must not change. So if we think about that for a little bit, every day when you come to work, are you the same motivated, efficient person? No, and I'm not either. There's no way. Humans are a complex animal and we change our productivity and our efficiency every day. There are emotional reasons why we do things and we don't do things. Frederick Taylor's ideas were great if we were robots, if we were machines. In fact, he'd have been a great software engineer writing code that pretty much doesn't change based upon human emotions. And the customer was told what to buy. Up until the 1940s, customers just bought what was available. It solved problems, there's a, 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 a solution, let's buy it, cheapest solution, excellent, let's do that. However, we went through two world wars, the consumerism boom, and now everyone is far more educated. After the consumerism boom, the world started realizing that people wanted choice. A different color, a Toyota, not a Ford. A skateboard, not a car. Electric vehicles, not petrol powered. People want a choice about what they purchase. People buy, companies don't sell. Taylorism is great for doing what the managers want, for doing what the board of directors need. But they're not the customers. They're not the people paying the bills. They are the managers. So what can we learn from Taylorism? Is that maybe managers should be looking more at the vision as opposed to controlling the process. Maybe we should have employees thinking as opposed to just doing. I mean, they're the ones with their hands dirty actually doing it. Maybe they should be empowered to actually think as opposed to just doing as they're told. And what about actually having a perception of the end product? In Taylorism, the employee didn't even see the end product. They didn't experience it. They were a cog. Karl Marx thought of the Industrial Revolution as alienation. Alienation from family, alienation from product, alienation from customer. They had no intrinsic motivation towards fixing this problem because they didn't even know what the solution was. What we are finding now is that people are able to see the end solution, see the happy customers, and they're far more intrinsically motivated to actually help those people. We are social animals. We want to help people. So what we learned from Frederick Taylor is that we can leverage the continuous improvement of efficiencies to better end-to-end -end solutions for the customer. But instead of the managers doing that, we should be looking at the workers and, and ensuring that those workers have the skills and the thought processes to cr be creative and to fix problems for the customer. Paying staff more for productivity was a great idea, but it didn't happen. Companies didn't pay staff more. The labor market was in need of work. We had the depression in the 1920s and there was far more people looking for work than there was companies looking for people. And due to the ideas of breaking the skills down and not requiring such a master of a trade, there now is even more supply. Companies took advantage of this all the way up to probably the 80s and 90s, where they were able to not pay staff for productivity gains. One of the key fundamental things that Frederick Taylor even spoke about, they tried to commoditize labor. And you know what? It may have worked if the Industrial Revolution 
number two, hadn't come on to the Industrial Revolution number three. Technology in the 1990s exponentially went crazy. Now, good labor is in demand. We need excellent, creative, energetic, motivated people. And it's very hard to find them. So when we think that Frederick Taylor's thought processes are all done and dusted, have a look around your office. Have a look around. Is it open plan? Frederick Taylor. Do you have functional silos? Finance, sales, IT, Frederick Taylor. Do the people who know the best about the process suddenly become the managers who tell you what to do? Frederick Taylor. Over a hundred years later, and we're still following a system that was outdated 60 years ago. But today, we can leverage what Frederick Taylor first spoke about. We can think in a way that helps us become more productive as opposed to efficient. So where is it good to use this thought process? In complicated work as opposed to complex work. If we know what we need to achieve, and it's quite complicated, Scientific management works. If it's task-based, not knowledge-based, scientific management works. So what is task and knowledge-based? Well, task is it is very little creative work. If it's do this, then this. But if there's any little smidgen of creative work where the process cannot be documented fully because it needs the IP of the individual to add to, to create the outcomes, we, they are knowledge workers. Knowledge workers cannot just be paid more. They're not intrinsically motivated based on just salary alone. To quote Dan Pink, we need autonomy, mastery, purpose. So to recap, Frederick Taylor invented scientific management. Scientific management is now known as Taylorism for short, it was a systematic way of thinking and continuously improving based on the idea that the managers knew best and the workers are doers. It commoditized or tried to commoditize labor. It had a thought process that humans were cogs in the wheel and the customer doesn't change. Their needs do not change. It was great to bring us to the next level in the 50s once once the war broke out, once commoditization came out, once education came out, we now know that this way of thinking does not serve the customer in the greatest way. It does not lead to the greatest competitive advantage, but we can still learn from Frederick Taylor. We can still continue to improve. We can still look at managers having a vision and we can add on some intrinsic motivation. Where the work is task base, we can have a systematic process. As long as we know that that is one process inside the end-to-end -end customer value, the customer journey. By breaking those down into small processes, it works as long as we know that it's going to change and it's going to change. Change is the only constant that we know. So this video went over what is Taylorism. It went through the core concepts of Taylorism. It went through the benefits and the limitations. And I tried to bring in how we can actually leverage Taylorism today. Because it's not all bad. It's got a bad rap at the moment, but it's not all bad. Awesome. My name is Mike. I'm the Agile Coach. I'm from Surge Management. And I thank you for listening to the video. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Awesome. Cheers, guys.